And Jesus was talking to a group of people, and he said they're not going to be convinced by Moses and the prophets, and they're not going to be convinced even by a resurrection of the dead. Now, if this is just a parable, does that mean it has no meaning, or does it have a lot of lessons for us? It has a lot of lessons for us, and why did Jesus say it in the first place? What's the context? If you go back to chapter 16, and if you look at the end of verse 13, here's the context. Jesus was talking, and at the end of the verse, he said, you cannot serve God and money. God and mammon, or money. Verse 14 says, The Pharisees also who were covetous, they heard all these things, and they derided him. So here's a group of uh, wealthy Pharisees listening to Jesus say, You can't serve God and money, and they were mocking him. And what were they mocking him with? Their tongues. They were mocking him with their tongues. And if you go down to verse 15, the Bible says he said to them, to the Pharisees, and then he started talking, and then without a break you get to verse 19 where you have the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So the context here is Jesus was talking to rich Pharisees who were mocking him with their tongues, and then he told them a story about a rich man who instead of going up, went down. And then when he was down, he looked up and he said to Abraham to send Lazarus to tip his, take his finger and touch his tongue because he was being tormented in the fire. And when you really think about the context, what's happening is Jesus was telling a story to rich Pharisees who were mocking him with their tongues, and he was warning them that if you keep going in this direction, guess where you're going to end up? You're going to end up in the, in the fire. But you don't take every detail literally. Not every detail was meant to be taken literally. This is, this is a story. Now, we already started our meeting uh, today by looking at Matthew 13 when Jesus told parables. And there was one time in verse uh, 36, which we already read, where the disciples came to Jesus and they said, explain to us the parable. Interpret the parable for us. Help us to understand what you're saying. And then Jesus did that. He explained it. And when he explained the parable, then he clarified in Matthew 12, uh, 13, verse 40, when did he say the fire actually comes? At the end of the world. Right. So when Jesus explained the parable, he said it's at the end. Now, in Luke 16, he didn't explain it. The disciples didn't ask him. It would have been interesting if they would have said, Lord, uh, explain to us this parable. But he didn't. But he did in Matthew 13, and there he tells us clearly that it happens at the end of the world. So I think we can build a solid case for Luke 16 being a parable. And besides that, uh, why would Jesus teach something in Luke 16 which contradicts the rest of the Bible? It just wouldn't make sense. You don't build a doctrine on one passage in Luke 16 that contradicts Matthew, Mark, John, Acts, Peter, Paul, Jude, James. You just don't do that. Uh, that's called situation theology. We don't want to develop a doctrine on situations. We want a doctrinal theology based upon the whole Bible. Doesn't that make sense? All right, let's go back to Revelation 20, and let's take a little closer look at what happens at the end of the thousand years. And then let's look at another issue. Where does the fire take place, and how long does it go on? Revelation 20. And, and let me just also tell you, in most of this meeting, I'm going to talk to your head with these Bible texts. But when I get to the end, I'm going to shift gears and really talk to your heart and put it all together. But I've got to convince your minds first because we've got to, you know, we can't let our hearts lead us. We have to let our minds lead us. So Revelation chapter 20 talks about the end of the thousand years. And let's look at verse 7, 27. The Bible says, When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. We talked about this. This is the lost, all resurrected, and they're all being gathered against the new Jerusalem for a final battle. They went up on the breadth of the what? The breadth of the earth. So where are they? They're on the earth. Right. They're not out in space somewhere. They're not under the ground. They're on the earth at the end of the thousand years. They've been resurrected. And then it says they compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And then it says what happened to them. Fire came down from God out of heaven and did what to them? Devoured them. So again, we know they're on the earth. This is at the end of the world. This is at the end of the thousand years. 
and they're marching across the earth and they're all gathered around the New Jerusalem and then the fire and where does the fire come from does the fire come out from under the ground no the fire comes down from where from God out of heaven it comes down and what does it do to them it says it devours them right it devours them so we know where they are they're on the earth and now let's look at the the ultimate results of the fire this verse says it devours them now go down to verse 10 here we have an issue we're on the horns of a dilemma verse 10 says and the devil that deceived them he was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they shall be tormented for how long day and night forever and ever right that's what verse 10 says so the end of verse 9 says they're devoured now what does devoured mean and it's like they're they're just burned up and they're gone but verse 10 says what happens to them they're tormented day and night forever and ever now here we have a dilemma and the question is you know which one is it are, are they devoured at the end of the thousand years or do they uh, burn forever and ever here's a photograph of an issue of World News, uh, U.S. News and World Report that came out March 25, 1991. Fascinating issue. And it was all, the feature article was about hell and what different Americans believe about this topic. Here it says the rekindling of hell. Record numbers of Americans now believe in, in the netherworld or in the afterlife, but there's a lot of different interpretations of what is going to happen at the end of the world. Here's a, a photograph from that particular issue of what a lot of people think of when they think of hell you know it's a place under the ground there's the demons there and they're they're biting people and eating people and the devil's probably down there with a pitchfork you know having fun and jabbing people that's what people think of when they think of hell some place under the ground where the demons and the devil are and the people are now here's the feature article under uh, science and society hell's sober comeback it says three out of five americans now believe in hades but their views on damnation differ sharply theologians are struggling to explain these infernal images and then notice that quote right out of that article it says a contentious debate is raging now among evangelicals over the traditional view that the torments of hell are everlasting there is a debate going on right now in the evangelical world among Christians about this doctrine and what's happening is a lot of theologians line up behind Revelation 20 verse 9 that says the fire comes and devours them and they say that when hell is over they'll be gone and then there are other theologians other preachers that line up behind verse 10 and says no 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 they're gonna burn and tor be tormented forever and ever and ever and ever and ever so can you see the reason for the debate some like verse 9 some like verse 10 let me ask you which one do you like better do you like verse 9 or verse 10 better? Okay, he said both of them. Both of them. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's talk about this. Well, first of all, we, don't, we shouldn't base a doctrine on what we like, right? If we like verse 9, you know, the idea. And, and, I, and I would hope that everybody, if you had your choice, that the loss would be burned up and gone rather than burning forever and ever. I would hope that every single one of us would want it to be that they're gone instead of that they're consciously suffering throughout all eternity but again we don't base our doctrines on what we what we want we have to base our doctrines on the Bible if uh, if it's really true that the lost 